Syncope is fairly common in pediatric OPD practice and the residents must definitely know about it. Let us first see the various uncertain terminologies used to denote either a syncopal event or a syncope mimic. First is blackout, which is a transient loss of consciousness also referred to as T-lock lasting for more than 16 seconds. It is to be used in common parlance and not to be used in medical terminology. Next is the breath holding spells. They can be pallid or cyanotic. Pallid are a type of cardioinhibitory vasovagal syncope and cyanotic are a type of transient loss of consciousness in small children where reflex action produces involuntary expiratory apnea followed by secondary circulatory events. So pallid spells involve a cardiovascular mechanism primarily whereas cyanotic spells involve a respiratory followed by a cardiovascular mechanism secondarily. Then drop attacks, this is a non-specific descriptor of falls and does not constitute a diagnosis per se. Faint is imprecise in medical terms, though it can be used to communicate with the patients. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS is associated with upright positioning. Psychogenic pseudosyncope is a form of psychogenic transient loss of consciousness that outwardly resembles syncope but is not a syncope in true sense as you all know it is a kind of feigning. Reflex anoxic seizures are syncopal attacks in infants mainly associated with myoclonus. Actually the term seizure simply implies a sudden event and not necessarily an epileptic event. So seizures to avoid confusion between syncope and epileptic seizures it is better to avoid the term seizure in a wider sense that includes syncope. And even though the term seizure means a sudden occurrence, the term must be avoided to denote non-epileptic events like syncope. So what is syncope? The first thing is that it is sudden and it is brief. Next, it involves loss of consciousness and loss of postural tone. So both these two things are lost. And third, the recovery is usually complete and is almost spontaneous. Actually, whatever be the reason, the basic pathophysiology of a syncope is decreased cerebral perfusion leading to loss of consciousness and therefore postural tone, although it is transient. Now mainly there are three types of syncope. First is the autonomic or neurocardiogenic NCS syncope which is the most common seen in 80% of cases. It is also referred to as circulatory syncope and it is generally benign. The three types are vasovagal syncope, the breath holding spells and the orthostatic hypotension syndrome. Next is the cardiac syncope and finally others which predominantly include the neurogenic causes or convulsive syncope seen in around 3 to 5 percent of cases. Autonomic or neurocardiogenic syncope is the commonest. It is a benign condition. It mainly has three components. First is a prodrome in which children usually describe there is a dizziness or feeling of lightheadedness. Then there is loss of consciousness followed by a prompt and complete recovery. Basically this kind of syncope is because of basal jarish reflex. Now what is this? It is pooling of blood in veins which causes both catecholaminergic surge and increase in vagal tone. The common precipitants of autonomic syncope in children are hunger like the children they skip breakfast, dehydration for example midnoon sports, lack of sleep for example, late night party, movie, studies, anemia and viral illness. The typical triggers include a sudden change in posture, prolonged upright posture and emotional stress. Now cardiac syncope is of three types. The first is arrhythmias which can be bradyarrhythmias like sinus node dysfunction and complete heart block, tachyarrhythmias like Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome and congenital long QT syndrome and Brogada syndrome etc. Then there can be outflow tract obstructions that is right and left sided heart tract obstructions. Examples of left ventricular outflow tract obstructions are hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and severe aortic stenosis. Whereas right ventricular outflow tract obstruction is seen in cases with severe pulmonary stenosis and pulmonary arterial hypertension. Then other causes are anomalous left coronary artery origin from the pulmonary artery and anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery. Also Kawasaki disease with aortic aneurysm. 
Along with these causes, one must remember that whenever there is a history of congenital heart disease or arrhythmia, or there is a previous history of similar events, syncopal events, or there is a family history of sudden cardiac death, especially in the first or second degree relatives, or a history of cardiomyopathy, or a known arrhythmia syndrome, then one must definitely think of ruling out cardiac syncope as the cause of syncope. As also, syncope in supine position and syncope at the peak of exertion are strong pointers towards cardiac syncope. So for evaluation, one must take detailed history. In autonomic syncope, you might get a history of sudden change in position or prolonged standing or pain or emotional stress before the event, a history of brief loss of consciousness during the event and the child may feel tired or unwell but not agitated or confused after the event. In cardiac syncope, which is seen in around 5-10% to 10 of cases, there is no prodrome and before the event, this is very important to remember, there is no prodrome. Then there is a hist there can be a history of chest pal pain and palpitations. Again, during the event, there is a brief loss of consciousness as is the definition of syncope. The child may feel tired or unwell, but usually he continues to remain alert. On the other hand, a neurological, which constitutes a minor 3-5% to of cases of convulsive syncope. Usually, there is no event preceding the, no feature preceding the event. They can be aura, especially in temporal lobe epilepsy cases. The loss of consciousness is usually longer. It may be accompanied with convulsive movements, incontinence or tongue bite. And post-convulsion altered sensorium can be there until the time the patient fully recovers. General examination should specifically focus on ruling out injuries secondary to the syncopal episode. One must also look for a low volume slow rising pulse known as pulses parva setardus. Also take four limb blood pressure, blood pressure in lying and standing positions to rule out orthostatic hypotension and should note should be alarmed whenever there is an increase in heart rate by more than 20 on standing. Then the person must also do a detailed CVS and CNS examination, especially looking for parasternal heave, loud adventitious sounds, for example, loud P2 in pulmonary arterial hypertension and murmurs. Rather, it is said that whenever there is a combination of abnormal family history, syncope during exercise, abnormal physical examination and along with this, there are ECG abnormalities are also there, then this combination has almost 100% sensitivity in diagnosing cardiac syncope. Further evaluation mandates doing an ECG. This is very important and it is essential to look for non-sinus rhythms, bradycardia, AV block and long QTC interval. We all know how to calculate the QT interval. It is calculated from the start of Q wave till the end of T wave and QTC is calculated by QT interval divided by the square root of RR interval. Then WPW syndrome, which shows the typical delta wave as seen in the ECG here. It is a slurring in the initial part of the QRS complex. Then there is Brugada syndrome. And finally, the strain patterns which are seen in ventricular hypertrophy. Further workup may require blood sugar examination, complete blood counts and serum electrolytes whenever indicated, an echocardiogram and cardiology referral, which is very important, especially if we are suspecting cardiogenic syncope, and an EEG and a neurology referral, if at all required. One must always rule out a cardiac cause, because otherwise the patient might not improve at all. Then, common for the common autonomic or the neurocardiogenic syncope, one must stress on prevention of stressors like Avoiding coffee and dehydration, avoid skipping breakfast, avoid waking up late in the night, avoid prolonged standing or any other posture and referral to a pediatric cardiologist whenever it is deemed essential. So, to conclude, one must know the red flag signs of syncope when syncope should not at all be considered benign and a specialist opinion must be sought or further workup is definitely required to diagnose and manage syncope. These are Syncope occurring without prodrome, for example, cardiac and neurological, usually cardiac, with exercise or exertion, again cardiac, then in supine posture or having a history of underlying cardiac disease, then with a history of sudden death in family, 
especially when their cause of that death could not be ascertained then whenever there is a family history suggestive of arrhythmias for example death due to drowning in a person who knows swimming or a syncope after auditory stimulus or when there is a family history of epilepsy i guess we are now more clear about how to approaching a patient with syncope thank you very much for watching and please do share the knowledge thank you